Okay, now that it's after Purim, um, it says in Halacha that the Chachamim instituted that 30 days before Yom Tif, you have to learn the laws of the Yom Tif. Especially when it comes to Sukkot and Pesach, there's a lot of laws that people need to know. In fact, it's interesting, in Halacha there's an argument when it says Shleishim Yain, does it mean including Purim you start, or the day after Purim. But the Alt Rebbe says in Shekhanarach, from Purim on, from the day of Purim, then you start learning the laws of uh, Pesach. So even though everything is already written in the books, but nevertheless, you still have to learn the dinam of, of Pesach. So generally speaking like this, even though nowadays you have everything written in the books, but it says that a person has an obligation to learn the books until they become experts in what they need to know for Pesach, which is a hard job to do, by the way. So now that it's within 30 days of Pesach, it says in Allah a few things. Number one, it's already care- you should be careful when you have things that they have, uh, you're learning or reading a book on the table and the table has chametz on it. You're more careful 30 days before Pesach to make sure you push away the chametz when you put down a book, or you know, just it's already in the in the atmosphere, in the spirit of Pesach. So you have to be more careful with the chametz stick and things where you're taking it around the house, what you're doing around the house, because you don't want to have more difficulty when it comes uh, right before Pesach to clean up the mess. It's also like this when it says in, it says in the Gemara a very sharp expression about somebody who eats matzah on Ed of Pesach. Very sharp expression. But halachically, it's forbidden, halachically, it's forbidden to eat matzah Ed of Pesach. Some people have a minig, they start two weeks before Pesach, meaning from the Shredish Nissen, they won't eat matzah anymore. What's the reason for this? that you should enjoy the taste of matzah. You know, it should be like uh, an exciting thing when you're doing the mitzvah. Some people have a custom, and that's our custom, that we don't eat matzah 30 days before Pesach. Now, the definition of not eating matzah does not mean chametz teka matzah. Ch- matzah is not kosher le Pesach, it's not matzah, it's bread in a, in a matzah shape. But what it means, you're not supposed to eat matzah 30 days before Pesach, it means, or two weeks before Pesach, it means actually Pesach deka matzah. Even if it's not shmurah matzah, but if it's matzah, which is kosher le Pesach, then there's a custom in our circles not to eat it starting from Purim. Again, some people start two weeks before Pesach, but halachically, it's really uh, out of Pesach itself. Huh? Huh? Today would be the first day. So basically, even the one after. Important. Some people, if you hold the shleishim yaim, begins. What we said, the machlek is rishenim. If shleishim yaim means including Purim or after Purim, so we the Alter Rebbe says from Purim. What? So we don't even eat the the machine. We don't eat machine matzah that is kosher le Pesach. Yeah. If it says on it not for Passover use, it's a not a problem. Um, just for the record, there are people that say you shouldn't, but lapel, you're allowed to. There's no question that you could. Okay, next thing I like this. There's a minig, it's a din in the, uh, the Gemara talks about it. There's something called mois chitim. The mois chitim literally means money for wheat. Nowadays, it's used an expression, mois chitim is to, is to collect money for, to give to the poor people that they should have the necessities of uh, Pesach. People don't have Pesach as a very expensive uh, Yom Tif. The Mois Chitim, actually, what they used to do is they used to either collect wheat from people or money for, for wheat, and then they would make bake matzah and you give it to the people that, you know, were poor that needed the money. So now it became a general expression, Mois Chitim, it just kept the name. <clears throat> Again, even though Mois Chitim means money for wheat, <clears throat> but Boris Chitim became an expression we give people money before Pesach um, to be able to buy their expenses. <clears throat> I mentioned many times there's this famous story. Somebody once came to a rabbi and he asked him if he could use milk 
for the four cups of Pesach. The four cups of wine, if he could use milk. So the rabbi, he understood the guy didn't have money. He didn't have money for wine. So the rabbi gave him a large sum of money and says, here, go buy wine and what you need. So his wife, the Rebetzin, came over to her husband and said, I don't understand. He doesn't have money, but why did he have to give him so much money? He needs wine, so give him money for wine. Why? So you don't understand. She's asking him if he can use wine for the four cups, I mean milk, that means he doesn't have meat. If he would have meat, he couldn't use the milk for the four cups. For the third and fourth cup, you already eat meat, you have fleshic. So therefore, obviously, he doesn't have meat. If he doesn't have meat, he probably doesn't have fish. He probably doesn't have anything. So he gave him money to he should pay, pay the, you know, buy the, pay the bills for, uh, for Pesach. Okay, that's as far as uh, the, prep- the preparations in the month of, of Nisan, or starting from the beginning of Nisan. Now, what are the actual dinim in the month of Nisan? So it says the whole month of Nisan, we don't say Tachnun, the entire month. Why don't we say Tachnun the entire month? So it says like this, Rosh Chaydesh Nisan is Rosh Chaydesh, like any other Rosh Chaydesh. Then as we read in Chumash, and we say the Nasi on, and during the days of Nisan. So every day, the Nasi of each Shevet. So there are 12 tribes. So like the first day was uh, Yehuda and then Yisachar. You know, all the, the various tribes brought the carbon. The din was that when a tribe brought a carbon, it became a Yom Tif for that tribe. It was a special thing to bring a carbon. So because we don't know which tribe we come from, so the first 12 days is the dedication of the Mishkan, and everybody, everybody brought a korban. So the first 12 days of the month, we don't say Tach. The 13th day is the, it's called Yisru Chag of the 12, or another reason is brought down, because that represents Shevet Levi. Levi was the 13th tribe. Then you have Erev Pesach. Erev Pesach, we don't say Tach. Then you have the eight days of Pesach. So you have the vast majority of the month already going away without Tachnun. So therefore the Allah is, and this is the universal minig, that you don't see Tachnun the entire month of Nisan. Okay, now, according to our custom, if you don't see Tachnun, that means you don't see Lam Natseach between Ashir and Avalatzin. You don't say uh, Tachnun, you don't say Tzidkoschan Khan Shabbos, you don't say Averachmim, you know, before Musaf and Shabbos. Uh, you don't say Tachnun, we don't even say Kel Erech Apayim <clears throat> after Tachnun, before you take out the Sefer Torah, there's those three lines, Kel Erech Apayim we, according to our custom, we don't say that either so basically all the things that you don't say on the day of Tachnun of no Tachnun, that we don't say um, okay, now, normally because Nisan is a very special month you don't, you're not allowed to fast the whole month. It's forbidden to fast. But there's one ex- interesting exception. A chassan who's getting married during the month of Nisan fasts. Not only that, he even fasts on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Now normally Rosh Chodesh, during the year, you're not allowed to fast. Even a chassan who gets married on Rosh Chodesh does not fast that day. They fast a day earlier or whatever, but on Rosh Chodesh you're not allowed to fast. The exception of this is Rosh Chodesh Nisim. Why? Because the Gemara says it's really Rashi, if you learn Rashi and Chumash, you see the same thing. On Rosh Chodesh Nisim, Behi Behem Hashmini, it was the eighth day, that when Nadav and Avil, Aaron's two children, brought a foreign fire and they died. So because Nadav and Avil died on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, it became, so to speak, a Saturday, because they were really, in essence, Meish Rabbeinu said to Aaron, they're greater than you and me. So because then, so even Rosh Chodesh they fast. So if they fast on Rosh Chodesh, so Chos and Kala fast the rest of the month anyway. Except Isu Chag, they have to pay a lot to fast. But, but it's interesting, they're not... Um, Okay. Well, Cholamei Bachlau is interesting then anyway, while we're on the topic. 
It's biblically forbidden to make a wedding on Cholamayit. Forbidden to get married Cholamayit Sukkis and Cholamayit uh, Pesach. Yom Tov for sure you can. Shabbos for sure you can't. But you can't get married even biblically. You can't get married Cholamayit because the Torah said V'samachta bechagecha. The simcha has to be with the Yom Tov and not with your wife getting married. So therefore, it's, it's one of the few times of the year, by the way, that halachically is forbidden to get married. Obviously, Shabbos, you can't Yom Tov, you can't, because you're acquiring something which is not allowed in Shabbos and Yom Tov. But even Chol because the Torah says that that's biblical. Other days are customs, you don't fast, this and that. But halachically, you don't uh, fast in, in, the month of, uh, in the month of Nisan. Or the Chol, you're not allowed to get married, Chol or... Uh, Pesach or uh, Sukkot. That's also a custom. Some people even take out a Sefer Torah to do it. But like we mentioned before, the first 12 days of Nisan, we say what's called the Nasi. It's in the back of the Siddur with especially Yehirotzen that you say. You say that each day what the Nasi brought their carbon for the dedication of the, Midgar, of the Mishkan. And then we conclude it with Yehirotzen. And in the Yerot, and you say, Shebe'im ani avlucha mishevet, and you fill in the Nasi for that day, Shebe'i awakened me all the sparks of Kedusha, you know, all, all that stuff. So the question is, if somebody is a Levi or a Kohen, so obviously they're not from Yehuda, and they're not from Yisachar, they're not from Reuven Shimon, Yehuda's one, they're not from the other tribes also. So do they say that Yehirot sing? So our custom is, the Rebbe Roshab said, that we do say the Yehudotzin. And you say, Shibi'im ani mishevet Ruvain or Shimon or Levi, whatever it is, you say that they are your Levi, or kind of means you come from Shevet Levi. So there's two points. Number one, in the Gilgal, the previous time, you could have come from them. And secondly, there's something called Ibor, means sometimes one Neshama comes into another Neshama, to help it a little bit. So then you could be a Kohen or a Levi, but you could still get a, a Neshama from Reuven, Shimon, Yehuda, Yisachar, you know. So we, our custom is that we say it anyway, even though, um, you know, we might be a, a Kohen or a Levi, we still say it anyway. Okay, one more thing we're going to discuss, which in California, it's a very probable thing, but there might be problems with it. The Mishnah says in Brachas, the various brachas that you say for the various different things. You know, thunder, lightning, this, that. Mark says, if you go out in the month of Nisan and you see the blossoming of the trees, not the fruits of the tree, the beginning of the blossoming of the trees, and according to Allah, it has to be a fruit tree. Some people hold it should be at least two fruit trees. So there's a special bracha you make. It's in the There's a bracha especially made for, but that's only uh, when you see the beginning of the blossoming. If you live in New York or where there's no fruit trees, so you don't make the bracha. You're not obligated to take a plane to go somewhere to California to find a fruit tree or to Florida to find a fruit tree. It says if you. You know, if you go out and you see it. But there's an interesting argument in Aloha. Is that only in the month of Nisan? Or could you do it in Adar or Iyar? If first you walk out, especially this year, Adar is late because we have two others. So what happens if you walk out one of these days, you know, and you see a blasphemy? Can you make the brach? So there are opinions in Aloha. In fact, it says that Shulchan holds that you can make a bracha, it doesn't mean nissen, only nissen. It could mean ear or other, it doesn't matter. But the Rebbe holds, and the Rebbe disagrees with him, and the Rebbe says, when the Rebbe says nissen, it's only nissen. And that's what the Pekiyasev holds, other, and they're right, api kabbalah, that bracha is really only for the month of nissen, not other, not ear. So that bracha you only make in the, in the month of nissen. No, because the din is like this. You can only make it the first time. Okay? And 
Now, the Rebbe Taka holds that if you, don't, if you saw it once and you can't make a bracha yet because it's not the right month, and then you see it again, you can't make a bracha anymore. So, so don't look. That tree or anything? <laughs> huh? Is it that tree? That anything? tree. That particular tree. Okay, so no, but I'm saying somebody has a tree in his backyard and he sees it blossoming, so you can't make a bracha. Can you make one a different tree after that? Yeah, it seems that you could. Let's say you see it on the first of Nisan and you don't make a bracha and you see it on the second of Nisan. Can you make a bracha? No. So you have to do it the first Unless time. it's a different tree. You mentioned about Sfarim. You're uh, not keeping Sfarim on the table. What? You mentioned about not keeping Sfarim. Uh, and the Chamez Dikatevo. How about year round? Uh, <coughs> Sfarim that year round are on a table. Like you have, you know, the benchers that you use for Kiddush and benching that are around Chamez Dikat table or, or Sidurim that you use regularly uh, during the meals or whatever. So Taka, the proper meaning is you put them away and sell them with your Chamez. So you have to go. Those svarim, by the way, that you want to use, that are on chametz sticker tables. So then you have to go through the svarim and make sure there's no chametz. What are you looking for? Crumbs. 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 Yeah. Crumbs. See, some people don't have the problem. They never learn. So the bach, the svarim are neatly in the shelf. You know, those svarim you don't have to dust, take out. <laughs> to dust them. To dust them. top. Or even more so, they, now they, they sell, I don't know if it's real, but that's what they say. Now they sell just the covers. <laughs> huh? A wall of spines. A wall of, uh, just covers. So it's cheaper, you don't have to buy the book, you know, but it looks, it looks good in the bookshop. Okay, yesterday we finished basically the dinam of, so to speak, the month of Nissan. So now we're going to talk about what's called Mechiras Chametz, selling the Chametz. Now, let me preface it with the uh, din as follows. The Torah forbids a person from owning Chametz during Pesach. The Torah says, what's called Le'ira'a Lecha Chametz, V'le'yimatze Lecha Chametz. Chametz cannot be seen, Chametz cannot be found, meaning owned. Now, what the Torah says, you cannot see Le'ira'a Lecha Chametz, the Torah means, as the Gemara says, Shalacha Yatoraya. You're not allowed to see your own chametz. Because the Torah says, it doesn't say Lo Yorae chametz. Lo Yorae Lacha chametz means you're not allowed to see chametz that belongs to you. Somebody else's chametz can walk into a supermarket to see chametz. That's not a problem. Then the Torah also says, Lo Yimotse. You're not allowed to be found, meaning you're not allowed to own it even if you don't see it. So the bottom line is, Chametz on Pesach is forbidden to own, forbidden to see if it's yours. Chametz on Pesach is forbidden even to benefit from. You can't even have anah from Chametz. In addition to that, uh, so technically you would have to get rid of every piece of Chametz. That, oh, one second. In addition to that, the Chametz made a decree, it's rabbinic, that Chametz sha'avar all of a Pesach, the chametz that was owned by a Jew, any Jew, that lasted over the duration of Pesach, even not the whole Pesach, even for one minute, at the end of Pesach, they owned chametz, that chametz is forbidden for a Jew to eat, to benefit from, and so on. If somebody eats real chametz during Pesach, the punishment in yesteryear was kardis. person would die young, like the same thing like eating on Yom Kippur, things like that. The Bajwund would be Kharis. The Chacham came along, and because of the severity of Chametz, the Chacham said that if Chametz was owned by a Jew, and it was owned by a Jew during Pesach, so then you're not allowed to benefit from it, you can't eat it, that's it. You have to throw it out. You can't do anything with it. So years ago, people didn't have, like we have today, bars in their house, and they didn't have freezer full of foods. I mean, basically they ate and they ate it up and they, that was it until the next time. So therefore in the Gemara itself, there's no mention per se of the concept of selling chametz. The Gemara tells a story, the Gamliel, the rabbis were on a boat and they came with coming pesos, so they sold it to a guy that was there. But the, the concept of officially selling chametz to a guy is not mentioned in the Gemara. 
It's mentioned in a Bryce and Tisefta, it's alluded to more. And this became more relevant in the later generations when people own a lot of chametz. I'll give you a simple example. If you have uh, scotch or vodka or all those types of things, they're real chametz. It's made from grain alcohol. So those are real chametz. So technically, if a guy has 50 bottles of whiskey in the house, then in order to, get it, to make sure they don't sin over Pesach, they would have to drink it up before Pesach or other things. And then you have other issues also. Then you have, for instance, the vessels that are chametz stick. So if I cooked chametz in this pot, let's say this is a pot, and I cooked chametz, so this pot also has chametz in it. So granted, I'm not over bal yiroh and bal yimotze because what's absorbed in a wall of a vessel you don't see, but nevertheless, it's still chametz. It's still chametz that you're owning. So therefore, what did the chametz come up with, the brainstorm? That you sell the chametz to a non-Jew. So before Pesach starts, when chametz, you're allowed to still benefit from chametz. We'll discuss this when we go on later. The time at Pesach that you could still benefit from chametz, so it's still yours, so then you could sell it to a guy. Once it's forbidden to benefit from, like after midday or in the last hour before midday, so then it's not yours. If it's forbidden to benefit, it's not halachically yours because ownership means you could benefit from it. If I can't benefit from it, I don't own it. If I don't own it, I can't sell it. So if somebody woke up, let's say, out of Pesach in the afternoon, or oh, I forgot to sell my chametz, I'm going to go sell chametz to a guy now, you can't do it because it's not yours anymore. You can't benefit from it, so, he, so it's not, you don't own it, so you can't sell it to the guy. So therefore, the Chum came up with this idea of selling chametz to the guy. Okay? So therefore, let's say, out of Pesach in the morning, you're still allowed to eat chametz, you can benefit from chametz. So they would sell it to the non-Jew, and therefore, legal transaction, and then after Pesach, they would buy it back, so it never was owned by the Jew during Pesach. Never was owned by the Jew during Pesach. So years ago, Halacha says, people were knowledgeable, so a person himself, if he had a, a lot, like, most people got rid of all the chametz they had. If they had a lot of chametz, so they, wouldn't, they knew how to learn, and they would sell the chametz legally to the guy. Now the problem with that is, if you're not going to legally, according to Torah, sell it to the non jew mean it's not going to be a legal Torah transaction, which means how the guy acquires it and so on, um, then you never sold it to the guy, so it's still yours. If it's still yours, you still can't benefit from it. So therefore, in the later years, I'm talking about a few hundred years already going back, even more probably. So what people do is like this. They authorize the rabbi, I'm going to use the word the rabbi, they authorize the rabbi to act as their agent to sell the chametz for them. So let's say there's a, what's called Shtar HaShah, it's a power of attorney, it's a paper that everybody signs. It's a power of attorney, basically, uh, let's use myself as an example, that if you sign the paper, it says, you're authorizing me to sell your chametz as your agent on Erev Pesach, while I'm still allowed to sell it, then I sell it to the guy. And the rabbi is supposed to know all the various different ways of acquisitions that we'll discuss soon. And that's the way the chametz is legally sold to the non-Jew, and therefore you don't own it. If you don't own it, it's not a problem. But let me give an example. What happens if you have a, a, a big whiskey company, okay, that's owned by a Jew? There are a number of them, by the way, owned by, by, by a Jew. And they refuse to sell the chametz during Pesach. Okay? That means, all the whiskey in his place was by a Jew over Pesach. That means a half a year later, if it's still from that stock that he owned during Pesach, a Jew cannot buy that whiskey. If you have, let's say, a liquor store, which is owned by a Jew, but he's not religious yet, okay, and he didn't sell his chametz. 
So now you can't buy liquor there for a long while because the liquor doesn't spoil. So they, they, you know, buy cases and cases. And it could last maybe a particular liquor can last a few months. You understand? So there's a lot of issues with this. If you have supermarkets, okay, that are owned by, an, by a Jew, so that means after Pesach, you can't buy anything from that, st- I mean, chametz. You can't buy real chametz from that store until X amount of time after Pesach. We can assume that it's already the new shipment and the Jew didn't own it during Pesach. So there's a lot of issues with all these things that people need to keep in mind where you're allowed to buy. We'll discuss all the issues. It's not as... But what happens is the Jew does sell it. I mean, the Jew owns the company, but he doesn't sell his chametz. In a supermarket, he sells it to a boy. He's supposed to sell it to a boy. Yeah. So what happens if he doesn't? He sells it again to somebody else. Oh, okay. So now the question is, what happens if the guy, let's say, use a, your case of a supermarket. The guy owns a supermarket, a Jew, okay? And then, but he stays open during Pesach. You convince him to sell his chametz before Pesach to the guy, but he stays open during chametz, uh, during Pesach. So now the question in Allah is like this. Is the fact that he stays open, does that nullify the sale that he did? Because he's basically saying, what do you mean I sold to the guy? I'm staying open. In other words, does that retroactively nullify the sale that he sold to the non-Jew? And therefore, everything in the store would be forbidden to benefit from because he never sold it, basically. Or do we say, no, the sale stays a sale. What he sells to the guy is stealing, but it's not chametz that's over the Pesach. He still has still benefit from it, too. So, yeah, I'll tell you where there would be a problem, by the way. What happens if that store sold the chametz before Pesach? But during Pesach, they bought more chametz. Now, what you buy during Pesach is not included in that original sale. So that food anyway is going to be a problem. Okay? Then you have another question in Aloha. I'm just throwing them out. We'll discuss in detail each one much greater length. What happens if there's a public company? A lot of these big supermarkets... Ralph's is owned by Food for Less, which is owned by another company, which is owned by, you know, today uh, the big companies are all... Kroger is the giants. Huh? Kroger. Kroger, well, there's a bunch of giants out there. Okay. Now the question is, it's a basically a corporation. It's not an individual guy that owns it. So now the question is, is that company, there's shareholders... So the shareholders, let's say, there's a million people owning shares in Kroger, let's say, some of them are Jewish, some of them are not Jewish, does that mean ownership by a non-Jew or not? So that's a discussion in contemporary Allah, the consensus of most opinion, this is what everybody relies on today, that if the board... The majority of the board, majority of the board, that means ones that have voting power, ones that have a say in the company. Stockholders. Not the stockholders. Stockholders basically have no data. I mean, once a year they get a thing. Huh? It's the stockholders who are the owners. I understand, but they pass them like this. A person on, on the board that has voting rights makes the decisions of the company, not the stockholders. That's called ownership. So then, if the majority of the board is Jewish, then it's called a Jewish company. If the majority is not Jewish, then you can assume that it's an, halachically a non-Jewish company and therefore they can, you can buy food after that. And that's why all these big supermarkets, Ralph's and all that, most of the bottom say you can buy stuff after that. But what happens if you have a Jew that owns a smaller grocery store? You know, and he's not religious. Listen, nowadays it's big supermarkets. Years ago, in the various, even in, the, in America, with people owned the, here, before the supermarkets came, people owned markets. So you had the Jews that owned it, they weren't religious, they didn't sell the chametz, and then you would have a problem of buying the chametz. I'm not chametz things, you could buy it, it's not a problem. But the question is, what do you do with buying stuff? So this is the whole issue, why the Chachamim instituted, uh, so anyway, coming back to this point. So if the guy sells his chametz, stays open during Pesach, is it nullify the sale or not? 
So the Rebbe has a letter about this, and the Meshav Feinstein also. They both say that uh, even the other people disagree. The Rebbe and the Meshav Feinstein hold that it doesn't nullify the sale. The sale remains a sale. And they were technically they would have to give back to the guy what they stole. But again, that's only for stuff that they own before Pesach. Stuff that they buy during Pesach, even if you sell the chametz, is not included in the sale because the sale said what you own now, not what you're going to own. So, and then afterwards they make up with the guy in case anybody used it, whatever, uh, you know, what? Are you able to include in the original sale an, an amount of, of money left for the guy in order to make purchases during that time frame? If you know you well, we'll get there, not tonight. We'll get there all the various ways, the documents that we make with the guy. You know, how does the guy pay for the chametz? Can, a rabbi could be selling for a lot of people. He could be having some multi-million dollar amounts of chametz, right? You can have big corporation, whiskey, whiskey or big, very big supermarkets or kosher markets that have a lot of chametz. So to be discussed exactly how it's done. Machat shinus